Okay, so to cap off this uh, wonderful first day of the school, uh, we have a special treat, uh, a lecture by David Gross on 50 years of QCD. And uh, David is not only one of the founders of QCD, he is also one of the organizers of this school. And uh, uh, it's perfectly timed to be right around 50 years since the historic paper by uh, David and his graduate student at the time, Frank Wilczek, which was written around a mile from here <laughs> in uh, Jadwin Hall. Uh, so yesterday was a pretty nerve wracking day uh, because almost all flights to New York were canceled and uh, uh, David's flight landed somewhere in uh, Washington, Dallas. And then uh, he set one, I think he set one of the world records in, in the process of getting here, maybe for the number of Uber calls and, <laughs> and the distance that this Uber uh, covered. So, so it, it, <laughs> he, he truly went the extra mile or maybe extra 200 miles on the way here. So I'm very grateful to him for showing up and uh, uh, we greatly look forward to this lecture. Thank you. So great. Uh, it's really great to see you all. We were somewhat surprised, the organizers of the workshop, at what interest there is among the younger generation in a 50-year-old problem, uh, which we know has to do with the real world and is enormously exciting. And you will learn a lot from the school, I hope, but you'll also, it'll become clear that there are a lot of open problems uh, that you can help solve in the next 50 years. We don't wanna, you know, QCD is gonna be around for few thousand years at least, and uh, it would be nice to, to finish it off or at least make significant progress this century. So it's up to you guys. 50 years, well, it's quite amazing uh, to think back 50 years ago seems on the one hand, like yesterday, um, especially coming back to Princeton, on the other hand, seems infinitely far away. Um, it's almost a hundred years anniversary to the birth of quantum mechanics in the form we know it still. Um, and so they're likely to be interesting celebrations <laughs> next year, and the following year. Um, but let me start the story at the beginning of nuclear physics with 110 years ago uh, with Rutherford and Bohr. So the story really begins with Rutherford's discovery of the nucleus over 100 years ago, um, which is, in my opinion, perhaps the greatest experiment of the 20th century. There were three things that Rutherford achieved in this experiment. The first, of course, was to discover the nucleus. The second was to uh, get a good classical picture of the atom. And the third was to immediately promote a quantum description of the atom and the start of a 10 year journey to quantum mechanics, as we know it. What he did, of course, was try to determine what the atom was made out of, nobody had any really good idea, uh, by scattering particles, alpha rays, which alpha particles, which uh, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for, for discovering and using. He never won a Nobel Prize in physics. I think if he had lived longer, he probably would have for this much more important discovery. His students, were the detector. They sat in a dark room for hours and observed the scintillations uh, of a fluorescent screen where the scattered alpha particles scattered off gold nuclei, gold atoms. 
And uh, he was very surprised that a lot of the um, alpha particles came back at very large angles. And uh, he calculated, somebody told me that he didn't actually do the calculation. That was disappointing. I know. It's called the Rutherford cross section, but supposedly he had the help of a mathematician to um, use Maxwell's theory to calculate the, the cross section and deduced, in fact, that there, all of the mass and for most of the mass and all of the positive charge in the atom was located in a very small region of space. You could only set a, uh, a lower limit of what the radius of the nucleus was. Uh, but that was the discovery of the nucleus and in a sense led immediately to a planetary model of the atom, which Bohr then um, turned into a Bohr model of the atom. And from there to quantum mechanics really required almost no new experimental evidence. It was all there. You had to make sense out of, out of uh, this, uh, out of the existence of quanta and the Bohr model of the atom, which was very successful. Most important perhaps, um, Rutherford invented the method we still use today to discover physics at short distances. You wanna discover the properties of matter at the subatomic length scales, smash protons on a fixed target or protons on protons or electrons on electrons, scatter particles of particles, lots of stuff comes out, you analyze what comes out, probability distributions of the scattering events. Uh, we haven't improved conceptually on that tool in 110 years, even though now we're reaching perhaps the limits of that tool uh, from an economic and technical point of view. Maybe we need to find some new method for exploring arbitrarily short distances, but we have it it's still Rutherford's. Of course, we've greatly improved it. The LHC greatly improved the detectors from these uh, observations of pinpoints of light on a scintillating screen, but essentially it's the same thing. So incredible experiment, the atom, the nucleus, and the experimental tool for, for high energy fundamental physics. Well, go forward 50 years or so, the graduate student. So this talk, by the way, is gonna be um, highly historical. The audience I see before me, say most of the audience, almost all the audience was not alive 50 years ago. <laughs> But I also realized that for many of the audience, their parents were alive <laughs> 50 years ago. Um, so 50 years for most of you seems like an awful long time. And I conjecture that very little of you, very little of you actually know much about the history of physics, the history of the standard model, the history of QCD. It's a mistake. It's not because it's interesting, uh, fascinating to understand your part in a grand endeavor, you know, to join this incredible uh, march to understand the fundamental nature of 400 years old, you're gonna be part of it for the next 50 years. But also you'll learn a lot about how to think, how to avoid going in wrong directions, lots of things by studying history. So might might be useful in addition to enjoyable. I admit this is my view of the history from a personal point of view, but that's always the case. The, anyway, so I entered graduate school about 50 years ago. At that point, I was at Berkeley which was the center of high energy physics. It had the biggest accelerator in the world, 6 TV, sorry, 6 GV. 
only down by a factor of a thousand, but it was enormously exciting because new particles were literally discovered every few weeks, new hadrons. Um, and it was known by that time that there were two kinds of forces that acted within the nuclei, strong forces, you know, an electro, what we now call electroweak or weak interaction. And I was always attracted by the strong interactions, partly because, well, there were all these continuing experimental discoveries, very exciting, but also it was especially intractable. New particles are being discovered all the time. They look just like the proton and the neutron, which had been discovered 100 years before. And they all seem equally fundamental, equally elementary wasn't clear at all what were the basic constituents of nuclear matter. And then, of course, there was no principle to determine the dynamics. There was no symmetry principle, the principles that guided Einstein in the case of gravity, or there was no direct experimental clues that guided Maxwell. Uh, following in their footsteps, people, of course, tried to construct theories of quantum field theories of pions and protons, and <coughs> but it was not based on any under, you know, underlying principle. And then even if you wrote down a theory, as Yukawa first tried to do, introducing a carrier of the nuclear force, uh, boson that would carry it with originally a spin one, but then spin zero, and, a pion, which was shortly discovered, one of the first particles in addition to the proton and neutron, um, was clear that having introduced the pion, you could estimate the coupling of that pion to nucleons, to protons, and that coupling was strong. So how do you calculate? So we didn't know what the constituents were, we didn't know what the principle that underlies the dynamics was, and it was clear from the beginning that you had a deal of strong coupling, so you couldn't calculate. Dyson, well known to this, in this institute, tried very hard after the triumph of QED, which resurrected quantum field theory from the doldrums of the 30s. Uh, Dyson tried to construct a quantum field theory of mesons and protons and you know, and to figure out how to deal with strong coupling. And uh, I think somewhat characteristically of Dyson, after a few years of trying, he was convinced that his ideas were going nowhere. Uh, there's a beautiful article, Dyson describes a uh, discussion he had with Fermi, which deflated him so much that he gave up and said, uh, and said, I went to work on other things. But again, like many theorists, if they themselves give up, they predict, as Dyson did, that the correct theory will not be found for a hundred years. The general feeling, I must say, was that something revolutionary would be required and probably not in the framework of you know, not just following the lesson of QED, a revolution was needed. Now, in retrospect, it's clear why the problem was so, was so big. And it's because we now know that uh, <coughs> the strong interactions are mediated by gauge fields that couple to charges, to color, to the colored quarks and gluons. And in the case of strong interactions, the charges were completely hidden. The quarks were hidden, the gluons were hidden. Not, not at all like QED, where the charges were quite visible and usable. There were no quarks. And people started smashing protons together uh, right after the war, when the government eager to build even more powerful bombs or whatever we would come up with, uh, gave, created the field of high energy and high dollar physics. But no matter how hard you smashed hadrons together, 
All that came out were other hadrons, which looked similar to the original ones. And you never produced the visible charges of the basic building blocks. Uh, in addition, quantum field theory, which was the framework uh, that uh, sort of was at the basis of uh, fundamental physics at the time, and had a remarkable success in the case of quantum electrodynamics in the late 40s, early 50s, was under attack. Uh, why was that? Well, the big development in the 40s, 50s was renormalization theory, which was you know, you know, retrospectively not such a big deal. It was truly understanding today in a profound way, but then in a technical way, how to deal with the UV divergences that, are, that uh, appeared in all non um, quantum beyond tree approximation in, uh, in any quantum field theory. But renormalization was thought by the inventors and developers of the scheme to be a trick. And sort of that's how it was taught at the time. This was a trick. This was a way of sweeping infinities under the rug. And it's so such a ugly way of dealing with what was thought to be a profound problem, UV infinities, that uh, it probably an indication that a revolution was needed. There are also absolutely in quantum field theory, and among the high energy elementary particle physicists, really no useful non perturbative methods. Um, in fact, first course I took in quantum field theory was from Steven Weinberg. Uh, I'm sure you, many of you have read his books. <clears throat> the time he was working on Feynman rules for higher spin particles. And he, first lecture, wrote on the blackboard, field theory equals perturbation theory. Actually, I don't think he said perturbation theory. I think he said field theory equals Feynman diagram. <clears throat> there was a theory, what we would call today an effective field theory, a phenomenological theory of the weak interactions, Fermi's four fermion theory. It was moderately successful. Um, there was no underlying principle behind it. It was phenomenology, but it worked extremely well. Very good effective field theory, but nobody had the vaguest idea how to make it unitary, how to renormalize it, and so on. It was not necessary at the time. The experiments didn't demand it. Yang-Mills theory appeared very early, 1954. But it was plagued with massless bosons, which nobody understood how to remove. It seemed to be, therefore, an interesting mathematical extension uh, of electrodynamics, but not a realistic theory. Nonetheless, of course, theorists tried to apply it to strong interactions. They coupled the gauge fields to the only symmetries that they knew about in the strong interactions, which were flavor symmetries. Now, today we understand those are accidental symmetries. There's no deep principle that says the up and down quark masses are, are almost the same and so on. It's not an exact symmetry, it made no sense. And then there was a, a real attack on quantum field theory. It came from my thesis advisor, Jeffrey Chu, and many others, but, but he was the leader of the revolution, which said among the rest that all hadrons are equally fundamental. They all looked the same. So let's assume there are no really elementary constituents. There might be an infinite number of hadrons. Somehow they're all equally fundamental. Uh, but then how do we construct a theory? So, and there was a second idea 
called the bootstrap. Now the bootstrap is something you've all heard of nowadays because uh, it's come back in the vogue and it's very interesting. It's so difficult to find a, a analytic unitary S matrix, as you know, there are very few exact examples, some integral theories, but uh, that wasn't understood at the time. And, um, and since there was no underlying principle and all, you know, there are no elementary particles, maybe what you should do is try to find a S matrix. That's what you observe. Uh, based on, that satisfies the general principles, especially analyticity, which follows from locality or causality and unitarity. That's the bootstrap program now. The bootstrap program back then was equally popular. You could start doing stuff, you know, writing some approximation on the left-hand side of the board and then using by crossing symmetry as a part from analyticity, write something on the right-hand side and see if you could make them equal. General, those general principles, the idea was, would determine a unique solution. Of course, we know nowadays that that's not the case. There are many solutions. For example, QCD with any number of flavors, any number of colors. So there are and we have now many examples of uh, exact S matrices. But that was the idea of the bootstrap. And what it did was create a generation, you know, a good part of a generation of young physicists like yourself, who uh, didn't know anything about quantum field theory. Now, on the other side of the Cold War barrier of the Iron Curtain, there was a perhaps more interesting attack on quantum field theory, the Landau pole or the problem of zero charge, which was uh, an investigation of, in effect, a renormalization group by a Russian group that studied how the physical coupling 1 over 137 in QED depends on the bare coupling to include the quantum corrections and take the ultraviolet cutoff to infinity as you should to construct a continuum theory. And working to lowest order and if you want in the beta function of the normalization group, Lando and his group discovered what that the physical parameters coupling measures the value of the electric charge in a theory with a ultraviolet cutoff lambda vanishes no matter how big you make the bare coupling. The coupling if you want, that defines the charge at, at the cutoff vanishes, which is a way of, today we would argue this, such a theory, the, uh, there is, if true, and it probably is for pure QED, um, although not proven, uh, means that there is no continuum limit. QED does not exist as a, uh, a finite, well-behaved, unitary quantum field theory. And that's sort of what Landau concluded. Now the phenomenon, of course, is screening. You know, we put a charge into the vacuum. The virtual pairs that exist in the vacuum screen the charge. And that screening means that the electric force decreases to move away from the charge, increases to move towards the charge. And at least in this lowest order calculation, uh, that effect means that keep the charge at infinity, which is how you do the measurement of the electric charge fixed, the bare charge vanishes and the theory is trivial. So 
Landau. I mean, this is probably true for all non-asymptotic free theories, non-asymptotic free theories in four dimensions, but um, Landau certainly didn't have good grounds, but you know, he was bold or jumped to conclusions. He said, 1960, we reached a conclusion that within the limits of formal electrodynamics, by which he really means quantum field theory, a point interaction, a local interaction, is the equivalent for any intensity to no interaction at all. Fix the physical couplings, no interaction. Uh, we are driven to the conclusion that the Hamiltonian method for strong interaction is dead and must be buried. Although, of course, we deserve an honor. <laughs> now, why do you say strong interaction? Same conclusion would be for QED. But of course, he knew, understood that the problems, you know, are so, the ultraviolet is so far away, so much farther than the blank mass in the case of QED, the Lando pole, if you want. This, uh, that it's irrelevant. But for the strong interactions, the problem was immediate. The coupling was strong. And if you went higher and higher in energy, it would diverge at some finite energy. So um, now Lando was a very powerful creature in Soviet Union. And uh, maybe it's not true for the whole community, but certainly his influence was enormous. And students, young students like Sasha, sitting back here, were not allowed to work on quantum field theory. And they were smart enough to continue to work on quantum field theory, but under the guise that they were doing condensed matter theory. Right? And he got into trouble, which we can tell you about some other time. So that was the situation theoretically. These are important lessons because you, you know, these were very powerful people, very smart, brilliant physicists, Landau, Chu, Mandelstam. Uh, so just remember that when all of us talk to you with great authority, we might be equally wrong about, not about most of the things, <laughs> the experimental situation was much brighter, I must say. This was just the opposite of today. Theory was kind of um, non-existent, but experimentally, there were many new discoveries, new particles, new patterns of particles, new symmetries, approximate symmetries being discovered, new accelerators. But even here, there are interesting lessons. So many theorists and experimenters at the time believed that the secret of the strong interactions lay in the high energy behavior of scattering amplitudes at low momentum transfer. But when you scatter protons off protons, 99.9% .9 of the time, what happens is they just go forward, spray a lot of particles in the forward direction. And you can measure things like a total cross section, fraction scattering, low momentum transfer scattering. Now we know that that's not what we do nowadays. We look at that 0.1% of the events which have large momentum transfer. That's how you look at short distances and discover new particles and new processes. <laughs> so why were they doing this? Well, it was experimentally easy. That's where most of the data was. They discovered some interesting patterns in diffraction scattering, Reggie behavior, constant total cross section. The theorists developed theories or ideas about how to describe diffraction scattering, total cross section, and so on. So there was a sort of mutual confirmation of each other's biases. 
for experimenters. It was good to study low momentum transfer because you had bigger statistics. Always good. Theorists uh, told them that's what's really interesting because they were studying Reggie poles and other things. And no one was really interested in the high momentum transfer experiments, which like Rutherford, this turned out to be where the secret of the strong interactions were to be found. The theorists, well, were mis misguided. The experimentalists, these were, these were harder experiments and nobody told them it might be interesting. So back to me, my story, after escaping from the bootstrap and nuclear democracy, which was dominant on the West Coast of the United States, I came to Harvard where uh, field theory was acceptable. <laughs> and I started uh, studying the properties, what we would call today the short distance behavior of composite operators in quantum field theory. Although again, you know, most of the tools have not yet been developed. Operator products expansions, conformal field, uh, it was really nothing. But it was, one could do this without trying to invent a quantum field theory because there were operators that are experimentally observable not in PP collisions, but in EP collisions, where you can measure matrix elements and correlation functions of currents. Currents that couple to electromagnetism or to the weak forces. <laughs> so, at Harvard, Callan and I would do, play the game of seeing what operator products in modern language would look like if you just made some model or more precisely used free field theory. And uh, among the rest, we wrote a sum rule for the structure function of deep and elastic scattering. So which we'll come to in a moment, which measures, which is in modern language proportional to the energy momentum tensor. And uh, this could be measured in deep and elastic scattering. Deep and elastic scattering was an experiment that was planned for the slack, the new slack facility, which had an electron beam, scattered electrons or protons at large momentum transfer. The Rutherford experiment again, but this time using photons to explore the, uh, structure of the proton. And Birkain uh, looked at this sub rule and noticed that you know, this, uh, this and dimensional reasoning suggests you know, it could be written without any scale. If you notice that this has dimensions of energy, this has dimensions of energy. Uh, and suggested that perhaps these things scale. There are other some rules one could derive, but one of the most important actually was one with Callan where, again, you know, taking products like this, how do you calculate? Well, you assume some model, which means some free field theory. And uh, what turned out was that the, there are two cross sections when you scatter polar photons, which have two helicities off protons. Look at the total cross section. And it turns out that the ratio of longitudinal to transverse polarizations of the photon are sharply different whether the constituents of the photon have spin one half or spin zero or spin one using free field theory. And then there are other sum rules the experiments showed, started in 1968 and 69 were reported, deep and elastic scattering at slack. 
Now, this is an interesting experiment again. It, in effect, discovered that the proton looked at, like it was made out of freely moving quarks. And not only that, the scaling behavior that is sort of inherent in free particles, free point-like behavior uh, seem to work. The quark model, some rules seem to work. And this, of course, was the discovery of quarks, experimental discovery of quarks. Now, these guys were kind of bold. At the time, none of the, you know, when you build a new accelerator, a lot of proposals for experiment. This was sort of, this is the Rutherford experiment in effect. So it was very strange historically that these were the only people who wanted to do it. Most of the proposals were not even sure what they are. It'd be good to go back and look. But this really, there wasn't a clamor to do this experiment. Everybody thought it would be boring. The lower energy, lower momentum transfer experiments that measured the form factor of the proton, the distribution of charge within the proton, showed that the proton was kind of diffuse. They thought the cross-section would be diffuse, like Rutherford. Before Rutherford, everyone believed that the structure of the atom was some kind of diffuse mess. Not interesting. Actually, like most particle physics, experimentalist, what they wanted to do was not understand the structure of the proton, but produce new particles. Experimental high-energy physicists always want to see bumps. They want to see new particles. They don't necessarily are motivated by understanding new structure and new process. <coughs> anyway, it turned out much like Rutherford. There Easiest explanation of these experiments was the proton is made out of freely moving point particles, partons was Feynman's word, that looked, as far as you could test them using totally ill motivated subrule, like quarks. So this was enormously confusing. <laughs> Now, the fact, I, the fact that some of my sum rules worked and the experiments together convinced me that hadrons are made out of point by constituents. The constituents were quarks, quarks were real. But then how could that possibly be? You never produced quarks in experiments. They had to be confined, we now say, within, there has to be some strong coupling that holds them their strong interactions I think is were strong. So how come you, you could uh, get free behavior? How could one explain scaling, the absence of quark? Now, again, you might think, okay, everybody got this message, but that's not true. There's only a small group of people who were obsessed with this. Most people, uh, for good reasons, said, well, this is interesting, but one, it'll probably go away. Now, when something truly new is discovered that isn't a sharp resonance, an obvious discovery of a new particle, people are justifiably skeptical. The errors in the initial experiments were 20, 30%, big error bar. The energy was extremely low, 20 GeV. You had every right to be skeptical. On the other hand, the, the conclusions were so striking that it, uh, some people it was, became an obsession, certainly for me. So the obvious thing was scaling. Now scaling had not played any role in, in uh, much in quantum field theory until that point. 
because scaling is not a exact symmetry of nature anywhere in elementary particle physics. Somewhat later, it became, you know, a big thing in condensed matter physics and the study of critical phenomena, but that connection was still somewhat in the future. And at that time, there was no interaction between the people who were doing quantum field theory, particle physics, and people doing what we, uh, the previous generation of my mentors called squalid state physics. So I really was obsessed with trying to understand how this could be. <laughs> it was clear that in trying to understand the scaling in the context of quantum field theory, that quantum effects destroyed scaling uh, immediately. The some rules that we derived were simply invalid in an interacting quantum field theory. By 1972, I had a plan, a very definite plan about how to make my advisor happy and kill quantum field theory. So the idea was scaling was real. The experiments were getting better. It was holding up. Some rules were even better satisfied. Um, and I understood that the only way scaling could happen would be that the opposite of QED, the at small distances, large momentum transfer, deep elastic scattering, you're probing the behavior of the theory in the ultraviolet, short distances. If the coupling could vanish, uh, asymptotic freedom, which we called it later, um, would solve the problem. And one thing we tried to prove was that that was actually required. And uh, based on an initial study of Parisi, Kurt Callan and I showed that for, in a sense, that uh, the framework of quantum field theory, if you want to explain asymptotic freedom, you have to have, sorry, if you want to explain scaling, if that's uh, exact phenomena in nature, then you require asymptotic freedom. We did not discuss non-abelian gauge theories uh, because they are in fact, well, methods, proof broke down. And then the idea was to show that asymptotically free theories, not that there are no asymptotically free theories. And that was you know, conceivable to prove because if you have asymptotic freedom at short distances, then you can trust perturbation theory at short distance. So you can do essentially one loop calculations and decide whether any given quantum field theory is or is not asymptotically free. And there are accountable field theories which are renormalizable. So that was actually proved by Coleman and I. All of this happened in 19, came out in 1973. And uh, there we showed that any theory, any number of scalar fields, spin one half fields, abelian gauge particles are asymptotically free. <coughs> Then the idea was to take the final theory. Um, the, so at this point, my first graduate student appeared, 72 or 70, yeah. Um, Frank Wilczek, when he still had hair. And, uh, and like, you know, I have one more thing to do. Let's calculate on abelian gauge theories. And this indeed is just about a year, uh, 50 years ago. So um, non abelian gauge theories, of course, had been around since 54. 1968, Weinberg wrote a, paper, a, a great paper called A Model of Leptons 
which put forward what is now the SU2, of course, U on Weinberg Salam, Weinberg Rasho Salam theory of the electroweak interaction without the quarks. Why didn't he put in quarks? Weinberg didn't believe in quarks at all. He just thought that was all nonsense for obvious reasons. Nobody's ever seen a quark, and how could there be quarks? And so, on. so it was a model of lepton. But it wasn't renormalizable, or he didn't know how to make it renormalizable. He didn't know how to show that it was renormalizable. And so there was almost no work on the electroweak. Again, a lesson for all you guys. There might be things like that that nobody's talking about that you won't hear about in these courses, just lying around. But when it hooked, Veltman showed that you could renormalize a theory and calculate, suddenly there was a And aside from the development of electroweak theory, that had the impact of introducing people to functional methods, path integrals, which were gave the understanding of how to write down perturbation theory for uh, gauge theories, ghosts and so on, body of couple. Everyone had totally ignored the use of functional integrals in elementary particle physics until then. Again, there might be all sorts of tools out there that nobody uses for uh, 20 years more. And of course, not even engaged theory. So this was the last. And when we discovered that these theories possessed the remarkable theory of asymptotic Bush and free field theory, to me, by that time, it was a complete surprise. Uh, because I expected that there were no, no. It was so universal uh, in non asymptotic freedom that that's what I expected. And, but the implications for me were obvious. Once you have that, you, that the only way following the previous arguments to explain the arcane scaling and one should look for a non-abelian gauge theory of the storm interactions. And there was, from then on, there was no choice. These arguments, the only possible theory was yang mills theory. As far as the gauge part of the theory goes, well, it had already been known phenomenologically that quarks, which had been identified as, which had been suggested as a way of organizing the flavor symmetries of the strong interactions, the approximate symmetries of, of matter, um, there had to be in addition three labels, degenerate quarks with three colors in order to explain the magnitude of the E plus E minus total quark space, pi naught decay, many other suggestions. But quarks are really thought to be mathematical objects. So no problem attaching three labels to them. Although there were suggestions that they might be uh, associated with the, with the quantum numbers of a, of a SU3 gauge group. So the, if you buy the colors and the <coughs> three flavors that we knew about at the time, there was no choice but a model based on three triplets of fermions with an SU3 color gauge group to provide the strong interaction. And um, that's QCD. Now, why does QCD why is it asymptotically free? Well, it's obviously the opposite of screening. It's anti-screening. And what is the physical motivation? Well, it's best to think about it magnetically. You know, Euclidean theory, that's just, in any theory you could think about it magnetically, electrically. Magnetically, 
gluons, we put a, an external magnet into the vacuum, an external colored magnet to the vacuum, the virtual gluons are like permanent magnets. So are, by the way, quarks, but the magnetic moment of the gluons much bigger, and they act like uh, little magnets would do in the presence of another magnet. They align paramagnetism, where the force at large distances increases and at short distances decreases. <coughs> paramagnetism is the opposite of diamagnetism, if you want to is no let a magnetic point of view. And uh, that's a synthetic freedom for you. And you can work it out numerically and calculate the beta function that way. That's of course not what we did originally. Um, oops. Anyway, I'd always wonder why Landau, you know, didn't say could have discovered all of this um, back in the late 50s by saying, okay, and anti-screening dial, dioelectric vacuum is a dioelectric medium, that's really bad. But what if it was paramagnetic? And he could have invented, well, yeah, Engel's theory already exists. He could have come that way to, to this discovery. But, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't doesn't work actually. It it's harder. Sorry. What, why doesn't it work? Well, I actually, we try, I tried, that's, uh, and didn't succeed, you know. You, so why doesn't it work? In QED, uh, if you were, if you're thinking physically about screening, right, you conclude that the QED is not asymptotically free. You can also just think about the diagrams that contribute to charger normalization. It's just a one loop diagram, vacuum polarization diagram. Its sign is fixed by unitarity. That's it. On immune gauge theories, the gluons are charged. It's a more complicated effect. In fact, the real origin of asymptotic freedom is because of the coupling of this external charge to the virtual charges. So it's really the triple gluon vertex that doesn't exist. So couldn't give a general argument indeed, partly because there are more diagrams, partly because it isn't in fact true. <laughs> but to do that, you had to do the calculation. So that was, well, I didn't do that with, that was the point of doing the calculation with my new graduate student who needed something to work on. Anyway, there are, you know, the one thing, the great thing about history is what you learn when you go back and read the original papers, you learn a lot, a lot more physics than you do by reading the, paper, the many papers that come after. Second, you learn about the mistakes that people made. You learn from that experience. And what you, and then there's the fantasy, which I like to engage in, but historians abhor, which is what if, imagining other scenarios. And there's, if you think about it, there's so many ways that one could have arrived at what we know to be true nowadays. So it's kind of fun to like Landau looking for paramagnetic quantum field theories, for example. Anyway, let's, we're, um, making the mistake of, I always make. So um, anyway, that explained, gave us a theory and a unique theory. There was really no argument about what you could, 
adding scalars to the theory. Uh, we tried, can't destroy asymptotic freedom. There was no, and everything we knew about the strong interaction with a few exceptions of outstanding problems like the U1 eta prime, so on, um, were consistent with QCD. But there was still the problem of why you always see quarks. And uh, in our larger version of that letter, uh, we were uh, considered the possibility that the, that the symmetry wasn't broken, like the weak interaction, but exact. And then, well, why don't we see these mass, these gluons? And noted that there could be little connection between the free Lagrangian to write down the spectrum of states because of strong coupling. And it could be that that suppresses all but color singlet states. Now, the idea was really at that point, nothing more than the fact that since the force gets stronger, extrapolation of perturbation theory, uh, that could confine the quarks. <laughs> but that was a very uncomfortable idea because there was no real understanding. We now understand uh, how that occurs. Well, so um, classically, of course, the force between quarks falls off like one over R, Gauss's law. And atoms can be ionized. And at the classical level, of course, that's what would happen, more or less. It's the properties of the virtual particles in the vacuum or the vacuum, which we now have pictures of from lattice gauge theory, that modify the flux lines that and squeeze the flux through a flux tube. Now, this picture uh, was put forward pretty rapidly by Mandelstam and Hoft, others of an electromagnetic, a dual analog of vortex flux tubes in a superconductor. And naively, electrical confinement is a kind of dual to magnetic confinement of monopoles in the superconductor. And as you heard in the previous talk by Mita, that a very vague analogy is one of the directions where we might hope to prove or use uh, such ideas to understand mesons as flux tubes of electrical flux. And of course, that kind of confinement produces a uh, linear confinement because the flux now penetrating a finite area and we can see that on the lattice. So that was a physical picture that came along and is still after 50, almost 50 years, we're trying to make that into uh, a picture that has mathematical rigor and more important analytic control. That's the goal of this, this collaboration on confinement. Now, historically, QCD was not accepted by everybody, of course, but it was immediate for a very small group of what I call spark people. It was really interesting to see how people reacted to an idea like that. But for the majority of my colleagues, the people on the West Coast didn't understand quantum field theory at all. Ken Wilson, who should have discovered this, was 
motivated by the idea that all interesting fundamental questions in physics are consequences of what emerges in the infrared from some ultraviolet theory which you didn't care about. And that the experiments which suggested simple scaling of short distances would, dis would that was not just experimental, too early to tell would disappear. Um, and then there were people like my colleague at Princeton, Eugene Wigner, who could not accept that you could possibly describe a theory in terms of particles you couldn't produce as asymptotic states because his definition of an elementary particle was an irreducible unitary representation of the Poincaré group that you could produce as asymptotic states to the observables which are S matrix elements. But for this group and probably many others, it was almost immediate. And in addition, you could calculate easily using perturbation theory, you could make predictions. And uh, that's what physicists like to do. So there was a slow but steady growth, lots of calculations, interesting applications immediately, but the real, oh yeah. Then there were very important theoretical milestones, at least for me. One was lattice gauge theory. So Ken, you know, who was misguided in what he was looking for, switched overnight, which I admire enormously, and said, okay, let's calculate the mass spectrum of hadron. 1974, lattice gauge theory, which you heard about today. It has taken 40 years, 50, almost 50 years to get to the stage where you can now calculate the hadronic mass spectrum to better than a percent. And an increase in power, which Mike didn't mention, by a factor of 10 to the 18. 10 to the nine of that has come from Moore's law. Computers 1974, for those of us who were alive, um, we remember how totally primitive it was. 10 to the nine came from theory, from algorithm developments, understanding fermions better, uh, finite size effect. So, uh, is quite, you saw some of the evidence today, it's quite amazing what they can do. But gotta remember, one can have, you know, let's calculate the spectrum. Uh, Wilson, by the way, gave up after a few years, said it can't, can't work. Nonetheless, people persisted luckily, but it did take an increase in power of the, by 18 orders of magnitude. Um, for me, the sidebar phi squared theory, two dimensional theory with no parameters except for coupling and developed the, dy the dynamical mass gap and dimensional transmutation was very important to see an asymptotically free theory, albeit in two dimensions that for large n you could solve exactly and develop the kind of non perturbative mass gap that we expect in QCD. Also, Ed Hoof's solution for large n again of two dimensional QCD, which kind of confines trivially in a way, but still exhibited a model where you could see the fundamental quarks at short distances, but are never produced as asymptotic states, was very reassuring of that possibility in QCD. <laughs> but the real thing that changed the theory acceptance was uh, electron positron annihilation. So there the story is interesting. The ratio of the total cross section for e plus e minus to go to hadrons compared to electrons predicted by QCD by just scaling to be a constant by QCD to depend 
number of quarks, number of color charges of the quarks. And it worked very well. One of the tri early triumphs of, of these ideas. This is a plot of what the data looked like in the summer of 1974. I was at a conference at the ICTP in Trieste. Bert Richter showed this plot, new experiments at the E plus E minus uh, storage ring at uh, Slack. And he concentrated on this, these new data points, which he said shows that the cross section, this ratio is not constant. It's rising linearly. QCD is dead. All those ideas, that's all scaling. That's where he, uh, he knew about, understood QCD, but scaling, whatever, it's all dead. Well, as you know, this is what happened just a few months later. Now, many of us in the audience, I think uh, Gayar and um, Pollitzer and Georgi had analyzed what a, uh, a charm, what the JPSI would look like. It would be very narrow because the coupling is going to zero. It's a Coulombic down state. Charm was accepted by all the smart theorists. It had to be there, it had to be another quark because of electroweak anomalies and SU2 electroweak symmetry and so on, so on. So theorists, again, at that time were very timid compared to theorists nowadays. They hadn't had many successes. So we didn't scream that, well, you're just seeing charm. We said, you're just seeing charm. But then very dramatically, this resonance, uh, this part of uh, charmonium was discovered and there were within months, within days, hours, no archive then, but rapid pre-publication of lots of explanations. But all the smart people knew, well, this is charm. And they could start calculating, not just charmonium, but other uh, charm <coughs> sided states and uh, all the other explanations for garbage. So this totally convinced lots of people that QCD was on the right track. And well, this is the, the last 40 years of using this probe of uh, vector mesons, as well as quark anti-quark bottom and the top. Uh, what about the te experimental tests of asymptotic freedom in the QCD? Well, as Mitat said in his lecture, logarithms run very slowly. So when it's starting with a coupling, which we now know is about uh, 0.1 at the range of a uh, few hundred GeV, and making predictions about what's gonna happen, higher energies with logarithmic behavior. So this is uh, 16 years after QCD. Uh, looks pretty good. Bunch of experiments. They all agree with the running of the coupling, but so does a straight line, to be honest. It's not easy to measure precisely logarithmically changing phenomena. And it really took more like 30 years to get precise tests. This is uh, 40 years, pretty good. Uh, nowadays, these are deviations from precise scaling at, at Hera. These are jet cross sections. This is the best I could find today. Uh, there are updates, but this is an indication of the precision of the tests from many, many different experiments so that you can now measure the 
if you want, the scale of the strong interactions or the coupling at that scale uh, to less than a percent. But that's sort of the direct test of the of asymptotic freedom. But using that one can calculate the cross section, the deviation from scaling, and the unbelievably precise test of uh, QCD at LHC, which is uh, you know, most of the events, um, since they haven't yielded any surprise discoveries. Uh, have greatly improved our faith in QCD. But the other, you know, what we really wanted to calculate immediately as soon as possible was the mass spectrum of hadrons. And that's a hard problem. That's not per perturbative. That's uh, the control of the vacuum. All we really have analytically and controllably uh, is lattice QCD, which we started to hear about today. And uh, as I said, it does require, it did require tech, new technology and new ideas over many, many orders of magnitude. But now it's extraordinarily successful. You'll hear a lot about that. There also have been impressive calculations uh, perturbative calculations where one can just use perturbation theory. Beta function now, this is, I just got a preprint is now like five loops. Amplitudes, which are used for the backgrounds for uh, new discoveries or required for the back, calculate the backgrounds for new discoveries and or tests of QCD. Uh, well, you all heard much the last decade about incredible developments in understanding deeply new structures that allow one to improve the calculations uh, beyond the leading order, which we did to next to leading order, next to next, next to next to next. Very beautiful, um, hinting at many deep structures enormously powerful, and that will surely continue. I just want to spend a moment on what I regard as the, the truly still, for me, the most appealing and remarkable features of this perfect theory, and I should really say perfect field theory. First, you know, there are really no infinities. No ultraviolet infinities, no infinities at all, no adjustable parameters, and no new physics at short distances. So what continues to astound me is, is how we've ended up with an example uh, so far of what a perfect quantum mechanical theory of the world could look like. Of course, we, we are, would like a lot more, but this is the minimum for the future. So there are clearly no ultraviolet infinities. I think that was clear from the lattice calculation. The lattice, as Mike explained, the lattice calculation, you never get anything that's infinite. You find the coupling on the lattice, you take it to zero, not to infinity, uh, as you remove the uh, off and you know how to do that. And uh, <coughs> all observables are calculable and you never have to subtract infinities or multiply by infinity. So the conceptual problem that bugged people from Dirac and Heisenberg, quantum, the beginnings of quantum field theory through the 60s and 70s, of the existence of UV infinities kind of disappears. Then we come to uh, no adjustable parameters. So recently I read a, a beautiful article by Feynman 
1961 Solvay Conference gave a review of the present status of quantum electrodynamics, which was incredibly successful. Did a lot of experimental measurements, which he summarized in great depth. It was about 10 years after you know, the big to-do. And he, he wanted, he was dissatisfied. He wanted to see, could quantum electrodynamics really be a kind of perfect theory? And so he said, uh, consider pure QED. Uh, QED has two parameters, the mass of the electron, the point structure constant. Well, let's put the mass to zero. Could we calculate the mass? Could we calculate the point structure constant? People have been trying to calculate the fine structure constant forever, partly motivated by the fact that its inverse is almost pure number. So consider pure QED with only zero mass photons and electrons and photons interacting with no other particles and having no cutoff. Such a theory could not produce a finite electron mass. Now you might think that's because the theory has a chiral symmetry. But Feynman at that point made it clear and remarked on it that he understood Lambeau's recent work and chiral symmetry could be broken. You, that's not an obstacle. He said, but the system is also invariant to a change of scale, conformal invariant, scale invariant. <laughs> and there's no parameter to determine a length. And yet an electron with a mass involves such a length. I'm not certain, Feynman was always careful, but it appears to be impossible to generate a specific length from no scale whatsoever. But that's exact, so he, could, so he concluded that QED somehow can't be improved, can't calculate the electron mass, can't calculate the fine structure constant. But as we know, quantum effects always break scale invariant, can, not always, but can produce a physical mass and then determine the coupling at this scale. And that's exactly what QCD does. There are no essential adjustable parameters. Now, of course, in the real world, like in the case of QED, there are other things. The quark masses we understand have nothing to do with QCD. They have to do with the Higgs sector, which the number of colors, who determines that? The number of quarks. But, you know, if you do like Feynman said, throw away the quarks, they're not essential. or keep the quarks massless. And uh, then because of dimensional transmutation, which I summarize here, the argument that you all, I hope know it, uh, all physical parameters are in units of choose one, the mass of the proton, calculable dimensionless numbers. So QCD is exactly the kind of thing Feynman was dreaming of achieving, a theory where except for some scale, which you need to measure masses, energy, everything is calculable. And that's true. And your job is to figure out how to calculate it at least in some <coughs> rigorously uh, systematic procedure. No adjustable parameters. So for example, the, the, I always lay audiences explain that the mass of the proton is really the confined mass of kinetic energy of the massless gluons and quarks that are rattling around in a confined region, which sets the scale and determines the mass and all mass ratios are calculable. And the strong interaction, of course, 
defines that scale and is therefore calculable as well. Now, from a practical theoretical point of view, the most important feature in the short term of QCD was that no new physics at short distances or high energies was necessary. And all theories we've had before knew that something was going to happen at short distances. And that's what people expected. But to the contrary, as synthetic freedom means, becomes simpler and simpler. Perturbation theory becomes more and more exact. The immediate implication of this was that for a whole community of people, which at that time was seriously, sort of 10 years after CMB, tried to study early cosmology, the early universe could be simple. Also, we had no problem extrapolating to, to higher energies where the forces could unify. And finally, large number of um, So, the implications of this for the early universe were really important because if you imagine having to think about cosmology using nuclear physics, oh my God, hadron fell to quark soup. Pretty soon it's understood that you've got to high enough densities and, and uh, temperatures Nuclear quark photons, hadrons become simpler. They melt. You have quark grown plasma, which we thought would be, well, we missed the quark gluon liquid that has been discovered at Rick. But, but anyway, that's all understandable perturbatively, more or less. And so there was no obstacle to extrapolating from CMB back to, as we do now, to very, very early times. There are phase transitions along the way, and this is another fascinating area of QCD, which is a very different crowd than the people seated here, but there are literally hundreds of theorists and experimenters and experiments And then, of course, the ability to, to extrapolate to high energies uh, led very quickly after the standard model was finalized to discovering that unification might very well occur at extremely high energies. These logarithms run very slowly. And that, of course, is the most important clue we have to uh, what happens near the Planck length and how the forces might unify together with gravity and dominated speculative physics for the last 40 years. But also to some extent, one of the very large numbers that govern the structure of the universe that tell us why, why gravity is so weak at our scale of energies and why we are not black holes is the Dirac large number problem. One of his large numbers, which he said, look, nobody's ever going to calculate 10 to the minus 19. It's impossible. Can't imagine a theory which could calculate 10 to the minus 19. And what he did was try to, he could, Dirac could have invoked anthropic arguments because you know, if this number had been 10 to the minus a thousand, we would be black holes, right? Life couldn't exist, right? Gravity would be much stronger and only a thousand nuclei would have collapsed to a black hole. But Dirac, I can ask Dirac's biography, did he know about anthropic arguments? People were speculating using that those arguments already in the 19th century. Instead, he was better, he was Dirac. He, uh, he related this small number to other small numbers, the size of an atom compared to the size of the universe. 
some of them are time dependent. So he said, ah, I can test this idea because then some of the fundamental units, the, the Planck mass or so on, uh, would vary with time, like the size of the universe. And that could be tested and has been tested. And so far, no indication of a cosmolo cosmological variation of these fundamental constants. But QCD can calculate this number, more or less. <coughs> or at least, you know, from a very qualitative point of view. Simply, it's the same picture, always. If at the unification scale, which is around the Planck mass, the coupling is, you know, of order of our extrapolation of the electromagnetic coupling. And then you ask, where does the proton mass arise from? Well, it arises from the scale where the coupling becomes strong enough to confine these massless quarks and gluons. That is given by the same kind of formula. And that, from what we actually know, is about 10 to the minus 19, 19 plus or minus 2, which is good enough. So that we understand that large number. <laughs> so it is kind of a perfect theory. It's the first example of a complete theory. No adjustable parameters, no indication of where it would break down, infinite bandwidth, if you want. But of course, it's not the real world, luckily. There are many questions we don't understand. And then, of course, we know there are other forces of nature, the rest of the standard model, and of course, gravity. Now, I want to end with discussing the other aspect of QCD, which is remarkable and probably a thousand years from now will be regarded as the most important thing that we've learned, which is the relation to string theory, which developed as a theory of the strong interactions at around the same time, motivated by experiment, by the fact that Reggie trajectories, spinning strings were linear, dualities between one, uh, expressing physics in terms of particles in one channel and by crossing the other channel, et cetera, et cetera. So, so much. And then of course, nowadays by exper theoretical experiments where we see the fat strings that appear in lattice QCD. And then of course, by um, <coughs> what we now have, in special cases, the beginnings of a precise duality between our description of mesons as <coughs> either uh, confining flux tubes or open strings in a fundamental string theory. And our understanding that uh, gauge theory and string theory are not really different kinds of theories, they're just different, often different ways of looking at the same phenomena are certainly part of the same conceptual framework. But as was the understood early in pushing fundamental string theory, once you have open strings, mesons, you have closed strings, like QCD, you have blue balls. And that is the basis for a lot of the approaches you'll hear about in trying to hopefully um, come up with a controllable uh, analytic control of QCD. Large NQCD is clearly an interesting limit in which uh, we understand that the theory must consist of infinitely narrow, stable blue balls. I'm now ignoring the quark. Non-interacting theory of blue balls, which is, if you want, the 
free field limit of some theory whose classical limit is, and it goes to infinity straight, uh, QCD, one over N is kind of the, the quantum of action. Might be a string theory, might be something else, but there is a classical limit, which is the of something, looks a lot, has to have an infinite number of Grubles, and many other features which make sense in string theory. And it's probably a string theory, although not the, the string theory we have yet constructed, although much progress has been made towards guessing what that theory might be. And ADS-CFT, of course, gives us enormous guidance. The evidence, of course, is <coughs> the structure, the perturbative structure of QCD and matrix theory in general. One over n, one over one third, phenomenologically works very well, much better than you might expect in comparing prediction, one over n predictions of QCD <coughs> with, uh, with nature. And of course, the strongest argument currently is ADS-CFT. And you all know what that is. So the hope really is, you know, one hope would be solve n equals four supersymmetric QCD. That's a scale invariant theory. It's almost solved, uh, at least perturbatively. Construct the dual string theory. Well, that's hard, um, but not, well, it's hard. <laughs> We're running out of time. Okay, that's not QCD. It has supersymmetry, which is not a feature of QCD, um, but you can easily break supersymmetry by, you know, uh, <coughs> pushing the masses of the extra particles to infinity, you have to form it, n equals one, or even real QCD in principle. You have to include quarks and interactions. Those can be treated systematically in a one over NC expansion. This is a conceivable direction. So let me just make a few remarks about the future. Perturbative QCD has much more life than I ever expected. The structures and, uh, of two dimension of uh, perturbative Yang-Nose theory, it's quite remarkable. Hints at something deep, but so far hasn't produced it. But those calculational methods for perturbative gauge theories are incredibly useful for experimenters and for theorists, so that will continue for sure. Numerical methods have reached a true level of maturity and uh, they should be available to people who are more interested in theoretical questions. And one of the purposes of this collaboration is to try to develop that connection. So we now have a tool which has been improved by a factor of 10 to the 18. We could take use of it, make use of it better. And of course, there are new technologies that will come along. There are many, many questions in QCD that are of great interest and open to experiment. You can make predictions, mostly having to do with time dependent phenomena, which so far are not discussable by lattice gauge theory. <coughs> So, on. and then experiment is still going. And although they're not discovering supersymmetry yet or new particles, they are measuring the properties of hadrons at LHC, at uh, RIC, at the electron ion collider, which is a colliding electron proton beam. Um, in the next 10, you know, over the next decades. LHC, LHCB, ALICE, 
the EIC, the electron ion collider. There'll be a lot of great experiments and you could be in the lucky position that my generation was in to actually in this field make predictions and have them tested. It's a lot of pleasure coming from solving problems, discovering new things in physics. But believe me, there's nothing more satisfying than making predictions that experimenters put to the test of nature and nature says, so far it works. So far it works. Never says yes, it says maybe, but with a smile. So tried to summarize, what have we learned? Feynman was once said, you know, I love this. In some, imagine that today he would have said AI takes over. What statement would, could we pass on to the cockroaches or to the robots that would contain the most information about physical world in the fewest words? And it's uh, not an easy task, one sentence. All things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. I think I really, I, I would like to see somebody do better in one sentence, no equation. What have we learned from the standard model? Well, it takes a whole slide. Matter is made out of in one half fermions. Forces describe our quantum gauge field, three phases, Coulomb, screened or Higgs, in a natural scalar field sector, and a confined strong phase with SU3 color gauge group. That's a, a one slide. See if you can do better. After 50 years, what have we learned from QCD? Well, most important, it is the theory of the nuclear force. Dynamics can determine all masses and couplings. Shouldn't be satisfied at this stage with any theory that goes beyond the, well, that even General, you know, improves on the standard model so all masses and couplings are calculable. But most importantly, I think it's gauge string duality. <coughs> um, the real hero is not a really gauge theory, gauge theories. And it is the base of QCD and of the rest of the standard model, most of it end of string theory or dual to it, and therefore of space time and gravity. That's the real hero of the story. But meanwhile, I've come to the end, but not the end of QCD.